Welcome everyone. My name is Nikki Johnston and I'm with Transition Advisors. Our webinar today is Succession Planning and Valuing Your Firm. Before we begin, we need to cover just a few important items. First, pl please close any programs that you have running on your computer. This will help to ensure a quality presentation and reduce any audio issues that might arise. Transition Advisors LLC is a proud and approved sponsor on the National Registry of CPA Sponsors, per NASBA. Today's webinar will qualify for two CPE credits. In order for you to receive them, you must complete two requirements. The first is that you participate in all six of today's polling questions. Please note that GoToWebinar does monitor your participation in the polls. Also, partial credit will be given for those of you that answer fewer than six of the polls. Next, you'll also need to complete an online evaluation. This will appear on your screen immediately at the end of the webinar, so please do not close your browser before you've had a chance to complete that survey. If you've both of these requirements, your certificate will be sent to you within 10 business days. Now, in order to fully participate in the webinar, please take just a moment to familiarize yourself with the GoToWebinar control panel. You should see it on the right-hand side of your screen. There's an orange arrow near the top. You can use that to minimize the panel if you wish. During the presentation, all of the participants are muted, but you can communicate with us by using the question box. You'll see that toward the bottom of the panel. Just type in your question and click send. We will answer all the questions as time permits. Now, I'd like to remind you that Transition Advisors offers two free one-hour CPE webinars each month. You can see some of our upcoming topics there, preparing your firm for an upstream merger, the urge to merge, and for those of you on the call that are in Florida or Georgia, we have a roadmap to succession planning specifically for firms that are in the southeastern U.S. You can see a complete list of our webinars, including the links to register for them on the CPE courses section of transitionadvisors.com. Now, before I hand it over to Joel, we'll go ahead and launch the first of our six polling questions for today. This first one is, how many equity partners do you have in your firm? So you can... See the poll there, see your options there on the screen, and we'll give everyone just a few seconds to answer this first question. And I'll go ahead and close the poll. Joel, just over half of the folks on the call today are sole proprietors. Then 39% of them are in that two to four range, and the remaining 9% are 10 to 19 partners. Okay. All right. So I'd like to um, remind you that you did receive a link in that reminder email from GoToWebinar that has a PDF of the slides. I just sent it to you in the chat box as well. So if you'd like to download those and follow along, you certainly can. And if you'd like for me to email those to you as an attachment, just reply to one of those emails. It'll go directly to me and I can send that to you as a PDF. So with all of that said, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our presenter for today's session. Joel Sinkin is the President of Transition Advisors. Thank you so much, and I hope you all enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Nikki, and hello, everybody, and welcome. Today we're going to really focus very heavily on two main topics. Succession planning in general, when to start the process, how to choose a successor, how to, and then a little bit about how to structure the deal, and then we'll spend a voluminous amount of time on how to value a practice, both when selling it to an external buyer or when selling your interest in the firm to other partners. Uh, to me, a CPE session is just that. It's an educational opportunity for everybody, but I do think it's important to have the perspective of the speaker. Since 1990, the only thing I've done and the only thing our company does is help accounting firms buy, sell, and merge with each other growth and succession strategies through M&A. Uh, so thankfully, you're speaking to or listening to us in 2016 as opposed to 1990 because over these 26 years, although I've been involved in over 800 closings of accounting firms, I've made my share of mistakes and I've seen a lot of mistakes, but we try not to make the same mistake twice. So the sillier you are originally, the better you should become as you progress. So fortunately today, hopefully we're going to help you avoid some of those landmines that we've seen over the years. One thing, though, that does frustrate a lot of people is sometimes they come in with a very specific thought that they're going to be able to hang up after listening to this webinar and have every answer for their practice. Well, the problem is 
every practice is very unique. I could take three different firms, all doing the same revenue with the same amount of owners, and there may be nothing else in common with them. Accounting firms are very unique. So if there's 50 things you need to know on how to do a merger acquisition succession plan, the smartest person in the room is usually going to only think of 35. Today we're going to get you well into the 40s, but hope that common sense will help get you to that final 50th point. You know, I, I write for the Journal of Accountancy Accounting today and quite a few of the magazines in the trade and read quite a few of them. I've written three books and read a lot. And one thing that you cannot ever see in any of these weekly or monthly publications is one of them that doesn't have a lot of verbiage linked to M&A of accounting firms. I mean, the activity is off the shelf, off, 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 out of control. Barry Melanson, a year or two ago, said that there was, the AICPA was expecting more emergence and acquisitions in 2016 and 17 than cumulatively in the 10 years from 1990 to 2000. So this is a crazy amount of activity going on. The questions that some, we should address is why? What's, what's the fertilizer to this whole thing? Well, certainly plenty of it is economy driven because if you look at 2006, seven and eight, in those years there was a tremendous amount of organic growth going on. And because organic growth was going on, the, the focus on emerges and acquisitions was quite a bit less. In addition to that, if you think back of 2006, 7, and 8, what was the biggest problem in the profession? Staffing. We had the work to get done, but we, but we didn't have the people to get the work done. Then we come to 2009, and all of a sudden the economy falls. All of a sudden staffing was no longer the issue. Clients and retaining clients and keeping them healthy was the issue. And then mergers and acquisitions became more attractive again because growth slowed down organically. So you had M&A growth. We're kind of back in this 2016-17 mode. We're back to having one of our biggest problems is staffing. So the growth, organic growth, the numbers have been very impressive for what most of the firms did in 2015 and year to date 2016. So where are the driving factors? Well, there's two really big driving factors in M&A today, outside of the fact that there's always going to be more people interested in making more money than less. Obviously, if I'm thinking of slowing down, I'm going to be giving up income. There's always people looking to pick up more income than to give it up. But the two big factors that we're looking at, one is niche development. There's never been a greater emphasis than there is right now on niche development. So many firms today ha are doing litigation support, wealth management, business valuations. We could go on and on. The amount of three-letter uh, professionals, things, CVAs and CFPs, is, uh, you can make a dictionary filled with them all. And a lot of the M&A growth is coming from looking to cross sell services by developing a niche or merging or acquiring a niche. IT has become so advanced that having satellite offices now is so much easier than it used to be. And you could even have satellite offices and create synergies. That's also a driving factor to the M&A world. But by far the biggest factor are the baby boomers. Over the next seven years, we are going to have the greatest exodus of talent we've ever had in our profession. At the same time, as we have never had a greater sense of urgency in developing and getting good quality staff. So here we are about to lose a huge amount of partners at a time that we have the, one of the smallest pools we've ever had of partner-ready people to replace them. So this succession issue is a very strong driving factor in the M&A activity of, of, of 2016 and will be in 2017 and the years in front of that. This brings up one of the questions I get asked very frequently, and that is, it, what's the marketplace like? Is it a buyer's marketplace? Is it a seller's marketplace? Well, the answer is unfortunately not that simple, but there is an answer. Let's start with location. 
Today I'm speaking to you from Long Island, New York. I know many of you probably thought I was from Atlanta, Georgia with my accent, but I surprised you all that I am from New York, although the cold doesn't help. Now, in Nassau County, Long Island, there are 3,200 CPA firms, the most in any county in the country, more than in Manhattan. There's more accountants in Manhattan, but not more accounting firms. So if you've got a small practice, let's say 500,000, a million in revenue, and you're looking to give it up, and you're in Nassau County, Long Island, there are a voluminous amount of firms right there available that could absorb your practice with little to no incremental increases in overhead. For that reason, in a very densely populated part of the country, it is very much, always has been, probably always will be, a strong seller's marketplace. Values here go for some of the highest values in the entire country. Conversely, if I'm two hours outside of Boise, Idaho, I might be in some of the most beautiful country that there is in the States. But I also could be in an area very easily that there's one accountant, accounting firm for every one or two zip codes. So in an area that there's very few potential successor firms, supply and demand takes over. And in those places, it's very much a buyer's marketplace. I had a consulting call two weeks ago with a firm in Iowa who told me that there was a firm locally that approached them to be their successor firm. And they had several questions, but at the end of the day, they said to me that they, they're leaning on not doing the deal. And I said, why? And they said, there's no other accounting firm within 20 minutes of us. It's only the two of us. If they leave where, and retire, where else are these clients going to go? Now, that's an extreme situation, but it shows you, again, how density of population can impact things. Another thing, so in a densely populated part of the country where there's a lot of accounting firms, it tends to be more of a seller's marketplace and the opposite in the sparsely populated regions of the country. Another factor that it has a huge impact on the marketplace is the size of your revenues. See, if I'm a three, four, five, six, seven hundred thousand dollar practice in a densely populated part of the country, as I mentioned before, there's many firms that could absorb me very easily. But if I'm five million, ten million, twenty million, the market's very different. I'm writing an article right now for accounting today where I'm using the greater Boston area as an example. I've been able to identify 41 firms in the greater Boston area, metropolitan area doing between three and $10 million. But there are only four local firms that are regional firms that aren't satellite offices and everything else that are large enough to take that size practice on. And of those 40 plus firms between three and 10 million, statistically, at least 50% of them lack the talent on the bench to truly execute an internal succession plan. So these firms are, are going to have to look at an alternative solution for succession and merging up, which means if there's 20 or 30 firms merging up and there's only three or four local firms that could take them on, this is where it has already become a strong buyer's uh, uh, marketplace. To give you an example of that, in New England, I recently had a firm that wasn't in New England that wanted to be and said to me, Joel, I'd really be interested in acquiring a firm in Boston or in, in, in Rhode Island. But let me tell you, if you had two firms both doing 10 million, one firm has embraced technology, but has not, uh, doesn't have the greatest metrics. The other firm has great metrics, but still is one screen, isn't paperless, isn't on the cloud. He said, I'm more interested in the, the firm that's embraced technology. I was shocked that the metrics would be less important than the culture of the IT. And, I, and because I'm a little cheap, admittedly, I said to that firm, is that because it's going to cost you 10 grand a head to get them to your platform of technology? He said, not at all, Joel. It's because it took me 10 years to get my firm to throw out the paper, to embrace technology, to get to the cloud. I don't want to take a step backwards. And he said, and let's face it, I'm in a position of strength there because 
there's going to be firms that meet my parameters who need a succession solution. So the market has changed. In some places and for some size firms, it is a seller's market. For others, it's a buyer's market. And the larger your firm, the smaller the audience, which is where that supply and demand is undoubtedly taking effect. You know, there are 45,000 accounting firms that are members of the AICPA. You have the top 100 that gets to about 36 million. Then you have the G400, the next 400 firms, which gets you to about 9 million. Then you have the other 44,500 accounting firms. So there's, as you get up in the chain, the amount of people around you surely shrinks. And that's why if I was to say the firms that are going to have the greatest issues in valuations, it's going to be of the medium size or larger firms. Now, there are always exceptions. If your firm has a very strong niche, it could overcome any of these issues. If your firm is filled with a lot of young talent, but they just don't have the capacity to replace all of the partners looking to leave, but there's a lot of good young talent, that could overcome. So there's always methods of breaking these generic rules that I'm setting. But that's kind of the lowdown of is it a buyer or seller's marketplace. What doesn't change, though, is an accounting firm really still only has three ways to grow. One is client at a time. And in a good economy, that's great. In a bad economy, that's treading water. Of course, over the last 10 years, what we're seeing is people developing a strong niche to cross-sell additional services to their clients, which both creates greater client loyalty, if I'm doing three or four things for them instead of one or two, and additional revenues. But nonetheless, the fastest way of growth in any situation is still by merger or acquisition. So there is certainly still a very strong market out there for most accounting firms. I think one of the things that people understand the least is when should they start to plan your succession. I should have mentioned before, I try and focus this particular webinar that we're doing today if I'm looking to grow through mergers or acquisitions, or I'm looking to merge up for succession, I'm tr I want everything to relate to both of you, the way we value it, the way we do everything. So even though many of you might be looking for growth, it's important to still understand when should that firm be thinking about to start their own succession plan. And let me give you a thought to set the table for this topic. A, the smaller the firm you have, this will be even more true. But most clients are partner loyal, not brand loyal. You know, if I go to PwC as a client, I'm probably going there because maybe they want me to. And if a partner retires, they slap another partner in, and I'm not going anywhere most likely. But most firms are very partner loyal, not brand loyal. The other thing we have to remember as a premise to what I'm about to explain is 99% of your clients truly have no idea if you're competent or incompetent. Because if they knew that much to be able to measure your technical skills, they would have known enough to do the work themselves. So unless there was an audit involved that they couldn't do for themselves, obviously, how do, why do you have your clients? It's not because of your skill set, even though you'd like to think it is. It's because the clients trust you. To me, it's a great compliment, not a negative. It's blind faith. You are the most trusted business advisor that uh, your clients have. So this is a very personal relationship. And the more personal that relationship is, the longer in advance you need to plan your succession. You see, the 13th Amendment prevents slavery. You can't buy and sell people. You need to have a strong transition plan. So when someone queries me and says, Joel, when should I start my succession? I ask them two questions. The first one is how many more years do you want to work full time before you slow down? <laughs> Excuse me. Now notice the question I didn't say, when do you want to retire? What I said is how many more years do you want to work full time before you slow down? Too many people focus on the end game of retirement. But most practitioners don't go for working full-time to retirement. They s gradually slow down in between those two phases. So how many more years or tax seasons do you want to work full-time before you reduce your time commitment to the firm? 
and how often do you see your clients in the same room physically face to face let's talk about this frequency of client contact in person you know in 1990 when I first started most of the accountant owners that I met and partners of firms went out every month or quarter to see their clients heck a lot of them did the work while they were there wrote their check the client signed it and they left but they were in their clients face four five twelve times a year depending on the client well now we're in 2016 between email and the cloud and fax and phone we communicate with our clients more than we ever have in the past but less in person than ever there was a statistic I forget where it was I might have been the AI I think it was the Rosenberg survey somebody but it said that 87 percent of accounting firm clients are only in the same room with the partner that manages them once a year so we may be speaking to them all the time but you it's very in, in, unlikely to have a great transition plan that's counting on transitioning relationships through the cloud or through email or through staff that's picking up the work and bringing it in so if I'm seeing most of my clients once a year in person three years sounds like an eternity before I slow down but in reality it's only three visits that's why I try and look at a three to five year window as the appropriate time to commence a transition plan so that very gradually we can do a transition where not day one I'm saying I'm slowing down and Jane and John are taking over but there's this period of time that we work shoulder to shoulder to get the confidence shared equally between the original owners and the, what we know internally to be the succession team so that we can maximize client retention so how many more years do you want to work full-time how often do you see your clients if I'm physically in the same room with my clients four or five times a year I could probably transition in two years if most of them I'm in the same room once a year I probably need four or five now there are some other things that mitigate this issue for example leases if I'm thinking I'm four years away from slowing down please don't go out and sign a 10-year lease extension I get the following type of call or one of my 14 members of my company get this call all the time hey I'll give you a great example from one that we had in the Midwest a couple weeks ago hey Joel I'm a two and a half million dollar firm I'm I'm looking to work four more years my other partner seven more years got a young partner but he can't take over for all of us we're looking to merge into a larger firm then he went on after explaining a bunch of things saying by the way I have beautiful well-appointed space great price great parking very convenient very visible so I just signed a 10-year lease extension so I said to this gentleman who was making this into an asset I said you're a two and a half million dollar firm how big do you think your successor firm should be he said we're figuring five to twenty million I said don't you think they have an office by taking that office obligation on he's basically eliminating 70 80 percent of the clients that may have been interested in acquiring his firm who don't want a satellite office in the same community they are or surely getting people that are going to reduce the offer they would have made to this firm based on the fact that they're going to not have as many synergies in the deal so be careful when you it's time to make a big investment uh, to extend a lease I've had people that realize they have to make a huge investment change in technology well maybe now is the time to merge with a larger firm and have them do it so are your clients brand loyal or partner loyal how often do we see them what's our lease situation these are some of the things that you need to digest and consider as far as when to start the transition plan now we know that you want your CPE so Nikki let's give them the second polling question so we can try and keep them going and getting them the credits they deserve okay the second polling question is on your screen now this one is in the next five years what is your firm most likely to do and your options are sell acquire a smaller firm merge into a larger firm or you're not sure we'll give everyone about 10 more seconds to cast their vote their answer to this question Okay, it looks like that's nearly everyone. I'll go ahead and close the poll. And you should be able to see the results on the screen there. 
40% answered that they aren't sure, 34% said they're likely to sell, 15% merge into a larger firm, and 11% say acquire a smaller firm. Very eclectic group of people with different things. Hopefully today we'll give you some extra things to think about that will help you to make the decision to do something or potentially not to do something. You know, it's not sometimes the best deals we do are the deals we don't do, and the opposite, of course, is true as well. Now that we've decided when we're ready to start our succession plan, one of the things we should also see is, is our successor ready? There is, it's amazing to me that, for example, in the over 800 closings I've been affi affiliated with over these two decades plus, how there's never been a situation where the successor firm did not do a due diligence on the firm they merged in, and how rare it is the firm merging up or selling does a due diligence on the successor firm. The first thing I'd like to ask if I'm a mergee to the merger is, why are you interested in doing a merger? What's your goal? Most of the time, you're going to hear a great answer. Hey, you know what? I've got some great young staff. I want to promote them to being a partner. Need more revenue to be able to spread the pie around. Hey, we just went on the cloud. We just we created some more capacity. There's great answers. There's also horrible answers. Here's a horrible one. Well, I've got a lot of extra space, so I figured if I merge someone in, and basically I could reduce my overhead and blah, blah, blah. Overhead synergies is never a reason to do a merger. You know, we spend more waking time with our partners in business than we do our spouses at home. If the only goal of a merger is overhead synergies, sublet someone the space. It accomplishes the same goal without marrying them. But a merger is a marriage, and it needs to have a more compelling reason than saving rent and software and, and sharing a, a, an office manager. What is their staffing situation? Do they have the capacity to replace the people that are slowing down in my firm? What's the age of the successor firm's partners? Do they have a succession plan? I recently had a three-partner firm in Florida come to me and say, Joe, we'd like to grow through acquisition. The three partners were 59, 64, and 69. Who's going to sell their practice to them? They had nobody below them to be their successors. These people should have been thinking about merging up themselves. But, they, but God bless them, they have no intention of retiring. And I don't think anybody should tell you when you have to retire if you own your, your small firm. But let's not be unrealistic that, that someone's going to sell you the practice. Do they have the space to move you in? Does their technology platform make sense to you? Do they have the financial strength to take you on? Remember something. Bigger is not always better. Better is better. Bigger very frequently is better. I will definitely say it's more likely that your successor firm will be bigger. But bigger in itself is not always better. Keep that in mind. Also, uh, one of the other things I'm, I'm writing now for the AICPA, actually, is an article for the Journal of Accountancy on the emotional side of M&A. You know, I will tell you that in 26 years, this is one thing I have learned without any question. The numbers are not that challenging to figure out. A seller's got to be paid for the years of sweat equity, and a buyer doesn't do a deal to lose money. And we're going to get to all that. But the emotional side of this is unbelievable. You know, if, if, for example, look at a sole practitioner. Right now, that person's master of their own domain. Maybe for 30 years, they've been the man or woman in their practice. If, when they think about merging with their successor firm in advance, it's a very daunting thing to them. Right now, if it's Sunday and work has to be done, I do it. If it's Thursday afternoon and I'm on top of my game and the weather's nice and I want to play nine holes, I'm going to play. The idea of having an additional accountability to becoming someone's clock-punching employee is so distasteful, people put off that merger. So here I am saying you need three, four, five years in advance to transition them. Someone sits there and says, well, I don't want to be affiliated with someone for three, four, five years. I'm master of my own domain. I'm irreplaceable. I had someone in a CPE event I was doing for an accounting organization a couple months ago raise their hand and say to me, when I was in the class about how to transition clients, and he said, you don't understand, if I'm not there, nobody could keep my clients. 
I said, well, then your practice is worthless. He goes, oh, no, 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 you don't understand, Joel. If I'm, you know, that's how great my clients are. That's how great and loyal they are. I said, no, you don't understand. If you're telling me that I can't keep the clients, why would I be the knucklehead to give you money for somebody I can't retain? And as we'll talk about at the later stages of today's webinar, the greater the loyalty between an accounting firm and their clients and their owners, the easier it should be to, to transition them, not the harder. But I get it. I'm irreplaceable. My clients need me. If I retire, I'll die. These are the real emotions that people have. And I'm tr not looking to be humorous about it. I'm looking to be respectful of it. And if you're the merger, you need to think about that and realize how these emotions play into it. But now if we've decided we're going to look into the process, how are most deals structured? We'll talk about how they get valued very, very shortly. Because I know whenever someone comes to this webinar, the main thing they have are three questions. What's the multiple? The second question is, what's the multiple? And the third question is, what's the multiple? And I promise you, we're going to spend a lot of time on that. But going right before we do that, we need to think about how most deals get structured. So let's talk about these five that I have listed on the PowerPoint today as a most frequent category of where they are. There's always in interesting, unique deals. The first one we're going to call is a, now again, these aren't mergers, these are succession plans, okay? They're held out to the world as a merger, but they're succession plans. So the first one we'll talk about is a straight sale. Now this hopefully doesn't mean I'm selling into my practice and going to Boca Raton tomorrow. Hopefully what it means is I'm no longer looking to work full-time. Maybe I am interested in working part-time. I am going to be involved to do a transition. But I'm not looking to be your partner, so I'm looking to sell you my practice, reduce my time commitment to the firm, and be in the transition mode, a straight sale. That's probably when you don't include multi-partner firms in emerging for sole owners or two-partner firms. That's probably the second most frequent deal I'm involved in, a straight sale. One of the least often deals, but the ones that I see every now and then, is what's called a buy-in to a buy-out. Let's use a simple example. Let's say that I'm the buyer and I have a $200,000 practice and Nikki is the seller and she has an $800,000 firm. Well, when we combine the new firm's a million dollars, for me to have been a 50% equity owner in that firm, I would have needed $500,000 in revenue, but I only had 200. So initially, with a payout period, I acquire 300,000 of Nikki's revenue now we're going to be 50-50 partners because I just did a buy-in. And three, four, five years later, Nikki retires. I buy out the balance. A buy-in to a buy-out. Sometimes the seller says, hey, Joel, I don't want the liability exposure of your practice. You keep yours aside, but you could still buy in an equity interest in my firm and, buy, and have a buy-out with me and basically be running two separate practices. It's doable. Another type of Buy, uh, of a buyer may simply sit there and not have a additional buy-in, but a merger to a buyout. So let's use the same example. I'm 200,000, Nikki's 800,000. The new firm's a million dollars. When we merge, I'm a 20% equity owner. And when Nikki retires, I have to buy her 80% share out. That's a merger leading to a buyout, okay? Not, not as opposed to a buy-in to a buyout. Those are, are deals that are done fairly often, not as often as the straight sale or the two-stage deal, as I'll explain. A deal that has been increasing in frequency uh, after years not seeing it happen a lot is what I call a cull-out or carve-out sale. There are three different types of cull-out or carve-out sales that I've experienced quite a few times in the last few years. The first ones relate to a niche. I had a gentleman in Philadelphia, had a two, three million dollar practice of traditional accounting and compliance, but also had several hundred million dollars of assets under management. He loved the wealth management side of his practice, couldn't stand the deadline driven nature of the accounting firm. But he felt the accounting firm was the springboard that got him the wealth management clients, and he literally felt stuck in that. What we ended up doing for him is we introduced him to a firm in his area that was large enough to assume the accounting and tax work, but was not doing wealth management. So what he ended up doing was selling the 
traditional accounting and tax compliance side of his practice to this successor firm, signing a non-compete in the same. The successor firm paid to acquire that, but signed a non-compete in the financial planning wealth management arena. When we did the deal, we held it out to the world as a merger of specialties. The seller said, hey, no one could stay on top of the day-to-day -day changes in the stock market and the constant changing and updating of tax regulations and so forth. So I've merged with John and Jane Doe. They're going to focus on the accounting and tax work. I'm going to focus on wealth management. They held it out as a merger of specialties. They even shared space. The successor firm who didn't do wealth management was licensed. So one of the other added benefits were they created a new business incentive program. This $2.5 million firm merged into an $8 million firm and said to this gentleman who owned the $2.5 million firm, hey, I've got clients that need good wealth management. We'll refer them to you and we'll work out a fee arrangement in sharing for that. And the wealth management said, hey, if I develop new clients, they're going to need an accountant. I'll refer them to you. So not only was that a call-out sale, but there was a growth and a cross-selling of opportunity sales there. So I've had people sell the accounting firm and keep the niche. I've had people sell the niche and keep the accounting firm. That's one version of a call-out sale. Another type, it's kind of a stepping stone to succession. On the West Coast of, uh, a year or two ago, we had a small firm doing about 800000 sole practitioner. There was about $125,000 of clients that he had just loved and had a personal relationship. They weren't his best clients. Matter of fact, they were some of the lower paying clients because they were some of his oldest clients. What he did was he sold all the clients on Exhibit A of the contract. I prepared about $675,000 for about with a payout period. But he, in his non-compete, he retained the right to service this $125,000. Matter of fact, he also rented space from the successor firm to use their technology and everything else. He was there to, to, to be the glue to the cement the relationship on the portion he sold. He retained his 125000 on the side that he felt he enjoyed. It kept him busy. He gave the buyer the first right of refusal to take those clients over at a latter date who were meeting in this office, so it would be an easy switch. And in reality, because the 125000 he had so little expenses on, his gross was practically his net. He added his purchase price. He wasn't even making that much less money than he was when he had his $800,000 practice, a call-out sale as a stepping stone to retirement. The last type is a dramatic cut-off-the-leg to, to save the body type of thing. I'll give you a great example. Texas, about six years ago, there was a firm doing about $4 million that I met with to talk about an internal succession readiness assessment. And after doing the retreat, it was clear they were woefully short of the talent on the bench to replace the senior partners who were looking to slow down. Woefully short. They acknowledged it, but they absolutely refused to consider an upstream merger. They said that they're going to develop the talent in the local marketplace to replace these people, and they're going to recruit. Three years later, they call me up. They needed four or five people. They had one. They, reached, they did find two. One didn't work out. They had one. And asked me what options. I said, well, there's your option. You have to merge up. We will never merge up. We, so what we ended up doing was taking a million dollars of their clients. The million dollars were their lowest paying clients. And what's the old rule that the clients that pay you the least, 20% 20, 20 of the basement of your practice takes up 50% of your time. See, their problem in executing an internal succession plan was a capacity issue. Like, there was a smaller firm. Remember, in a larger firm, my basement client might be a ceiling client for a smaller firm. So what we basically did was we called out a million dollars worth of clients and we sold it to a smaller firm. And we, we sent a letter out to all of our clients that because of our peer review requirements and being PCAOB, et cetera, we were going to have to give them a substantial fee increase. Instead, we've affiliated with a firm that's able to maintain the same fee structure, blah, blah, blah. So the clients were given a choice of substantial fee increase or going to the success of this other firm. 90 plus percent went to the other firm. By selling that off, which the, uh, they actually made more money selling it than owning it, but more important than that, created a tremendous amount of capacity that enabled them to execute an internal succession plan. So that's the third type of call-out sale. 
But by far and away, the deal that our firm is most familiar with and kind of invented and does the most of is a two-stage deal. A two-stage deal was designed for someone who wasn't looking to get out today, but was one to five years or six years from slowing down, but wanted to maintain their income, maintain reasonable autonomy and control, but set up a succession plan. You know, for years I went around for the AICPA and other accounting organizations telling everybody they needed three, four, five years to, re to transition. Why do you have your clients? It's because of you. And everybody agreed and everybody said, you're right, and nobody did the deal. They didn't, it was that accountability issue. So we needed to come up with something that overcame these issues, hence a two-stage deal. In a two-stage deal, let's start with how you, you, you calculate it. I'm going to use a real small firm as a simple example. Let's say my firm is doing 500000 and I net 40%, including perks, benefits, and the kid's cell phone, and everything I run through the firm. And let's say in order to make that 40%, I'm using one full-time senior, one full-time clerical, and a per diem during tax season. That's how I would, so I, my starting point is, what's my gross, what's my percentage of, of the net that I enjoy, and how much labor do I need to accomplish that? Now, if it's a five, ten partner firm merging up, instead of focusing on the sole practitioner's labor, I switch it to how many chargeable hours a seller is putting in. So in a small firm, we base it on labor use, used. In a large firm, we base it on chargeable hours. And then we focus on how many more years does this small $500,000 practitioner want to work full-time before they slow down? Let's say the answer is three years. So on our premise, $500,000 firm, netting 40%, wants to work three more years full-time than, than be of counsel, one full-time senior, one full-time clerical, a per diem during tax season. The, in stage one, I merge into the successor firm. Let's say Gretchen is, owns the successor firm. She's going to take over all of my operating expenses, labor, rent, software, everything. And she says to me, hey, Joel, you were netting 40% of what came in before. As long as you don't require more labor than you did in the past, I'll pay your firm that same 40% you were making now. And because I'm paying it to your entity under the guise of a consulting agreement, my entity could continue to feed my retirement plan, pay my car lease, pay my kid's cell phone. I don't need anybody's permission to do what I want to do through my firm. So as a seller, I'm being kept whole in income, providing I'm putting in the same amount of time, if it, in a, a chargeable time in a large firm, or I don't need more labor in a small firm. I'm having all the same tax benefits I had when I owned the practice, and the buyer is getting a current deduction. And for a sole practitioner, let me tell you why my time is irrelevant. Let's say I put in 2,200 hours of which 1,600 were chargeable. If I merged into your firm and I did the same thing, but I needed more staff than I used in the past, that's going to cost the firm more money. So if I put in 500 hours of 5,000, that's not what impacts the successor firm. What impacts the successor firm is what they have to provide me in labor. So the premise is, if I put in the same time and effort, we won't need more labor, and I'll be able to stay whole in income and stay in control of my practice. To the world, it will look like a merger, but in reality, it's really an infrastructure within an, inf within an infrastructure. The advantages I get as a seller in stage one is number one, it's like a PCA agreement, a practice continuation agreement on steroids. See, some people think a practice continuation agreement is a succession plan. It's not. It's an insurance policy, right? And it's, if I'm five years or less from slowing down, I shouldn't be doing a PCA agreement. I should be doing a two-stage deal. If I'm 40 years old, I might have a PCA agreement, but that's because it's like an insurance policy, right? But for me, in a two-stage deal, not only do I have the same coverage where if I twist my ankle, someone's there to cover me. If I get hit by the bus, someone's there to take over the practice. But also, I'm under the same roof. I'm doing a transition. They have all my records. So it's a much stronger PCA agreement. Also, from the seller's perspective, I kind of get protected in a way from lost client fees. Let me explain. Let's go back to me having a $500,000 practice. And let's say my largest client's a $50,000 a year contractor. If today I lose that client, I lose $50,000 worth of income.
because my rent, everything else is going to be the same. But if I do the two-stage deal with you, I only lose 40% of that because I'm getting paid 40%. So it actually mitigates it. I get free backup and support. And most of the time, I actually get to work a little bit less and make the same money because as a sole practitioner, I was doing the bill billing, collections, administration, QC, everything. Usually in the successor firm, they're going to absorb some of those things, which gives me more time to either cross-sell more services, develop new clients, transition the relationships, or just enjoy life. And by doing a better transition, I'm going to have a, a higher retention rate, therefore make more money as well. So in a two-stage deal, I have autonomy, control, and income, backup support, and a great succession plan. You might say, well, why does the buyer do it? Well, if I merge into your firm, and on my 500000 maybe I was paying $65,000, $70,000 a year in rent, $15,000 in software, another 5000 in malpractice, and you probably won't need either my clerical or, or my per diem. You're going to probably save somewhere between seventy-five and one hundred and fifty thousand dollars of overhead synergies during stage one. So while I, now I've had a lot of sellers sit there and say, "Well, they're making all that money in overhead reduction. I should get some of that." The answer is no, you shouldn't. As a seller, you got everything you wanted. You have control, autonomy, income, backup, support, and succession. The fact they're getting a benefits why they're doing the deal. Remember, they're taking over the billings, collections, the, the, the liability associated with same. There has to be a reward in it for that. So the buyer is making some overhead contributions, is basically guaranteed to be the successor of the firm, and because there's a better transition, it's going to retain more of the clients. So in a, that's all stage one. Stage one, let's call the merger period. Stage two is the buyer. You see, I can't keep you whole in income and pay you for your equity at the same time. So in a two-stage deal, we're deferring the purchase price to the onset of stage two. But, but remember, if you try and get paid for your equity and your time at the same time, buyer's not going to do a deal to lose money. So we're going to pay you less than your time is worth and less than your practice is worth. By doing a two-stage deal, you maximize the value of your equity and the value of your time. So, it, so typically, for example, in a contract I prepared not too long ago on a two-stage deal, stage one terminated and stage two commenced on the first of the following items. January 1st, 2019, God forbid death or disability of the seller, or the seller elected with, with three months' notice to accelerate their retirement to a sooner period of time. Now, most deals have a retention period. That retention period doesn't start until stage two, let's remember that. During stage one, the seller's still cook, chief cook and bottle washer. It's when the successor firm takes over that the retention period starts. Now, many times, the seller, most of the time for that matter, will stay on once stage two begins in a part-time role, an of counsel role. I get very frequently asked, how do we pay a partner who retired or someone whose practice we bought to retired when they stay on? Well, the assumption is they're staying on part-time. But we didn't have explosions over the issues, but we used to pay by the hour. We used to pay per diem rates, even a salary for a year. But there was a lot of issues that did get raised from that structure. The seller would call me up and say, I know I'm getting paid $70 an hour, but I feel like a clock-punching employee. I'm so accountable. It's not right. I'm not comfortable. I'd have buyers call me up and say, hey, it's great when Mark comes in. He's the glue that cements the relationship, but to come in and put his feet up on the desk and to get paid 75 bucks an hour, and I'm just using that number as an example, is stupid. I'm, I'm not comfortable. We switched it in most cases to a third of what you get billed out for. So if a partner comes back in post buyout, we'll pay him a third of what he's billed out for. And think about that. I'm not going to bring a partner in to do a bank rack. They're coming in to perform the highest function, build out at the highest rate, so they're going to get a reasonable rate on it. As a successor firm, I'm still tripling labor, which is my goal, and I'm not paying for non-chargeable time. From the partner's perspective who's staying on part-time, if it takes me an hour or it takes me a day, nobody's beating me up because it's all chargeable time. So I don't have that clock-punching employee mentality either. It's been a very good compromise role. We also usually give the seller a new business incentive program where if they develop new clients, whether it's during stage one or two, they get a reward for it. It's not the same value we'll pay for the practice, but it will be a reward. 
there are even times where during stage one, if you lose a client, we'll let you use a new client you developed as a replacement client. But most of the time, there's a separate new business incentive program for you. And so you have stage one, the merger period, that looks like a merger period to the world, almost never does the seller take equity at that time. But, and stage two is the buyout. Of course, that brings us to what is the multiple. But before that, let me just share with you something we just went through. Let's say I have a multi-partner firm. If everybody's looking to get out at the same time, simple, we do a straight sale, but that's very rare. Usually, what we have is a situation like I have right now in Washington, D.C. I have a four-partner firm. Two of them are late 40s, early 50s. The other, one of them, 62, wants to work three more years. One, 66, doesn't want to work any more years full-time. For the two younger people, we're doing a merger. They're exchanging equity in their firm for equity in the combined firm. For the 61-year-old partner, she's getting a two-stage deal. For the 66-year-old partner, he's getting an immediate sale. By understanding these different deal structures, what you're able to do is have a firm that has multiple partners in different places in their career and custom make a deal for each of them. This way, everybody doesn't have to marry themselves to being a, buy, a seller or a buyer, a merging, a merger. We can work that out. So that's the great strength in understanding these different types of deal structures. And if your partner's staying on, which is a completely different class that we teach, you're going to have to look into other things. What does equity mean when we merge? Are there retention elements that are going to impact compensation? How does compensation work? And what is their firm buyout? So that brings us to a whole different thing that we're not going to do today, but we teach a lot of webinars on, on compensation, partnership agreements, what equity means, things of that nature. So this good brings us to what is the multiple. But let's get the second polling question in so we can go through what the multiple is without being interrupted. Nikki? Okay, this is actually your third polling question. Um, this Ooh. question is, does your firm have adequate talent on the bench to replace retiring partners? And here your answers are no, you don't. You think you do, but you aren't sure how to admit them. You do, and you're confident that it will work, or you don't plan to pursue internal succession. And again, we will have six polling questions, so this is our third of six today. And it looks like that's nearly everyone, so I'll go ahead and close the poll. About half say that they don't, 23% say they think so, but aren't sure how to admit them, and then a pretty even split between the other two options. Well, that's great information, and keep in mind, of, of the, the method, my, my partner Terry just taught a class on admitting new partners, and we could always discuss that and help people with that. But also, let's be realistic in these assumptions. You know, I, not too long ago, I had a firm in California call me up, and they were a small firm doing about 900000 and they, they were two partners, and they were both looking to slow down, and they felt they had really two great young people ready to step up. And as we got deeper into it, we realized those two young people were already putting in 2,600 hours, of which 1,800 or more were chargeable. And there was nobody below them they could move that work down to. So even though they had young talent, they still didn't have the capacity to replace them. And both of them were strong tax people, but one of the partners retiring was an audit person. Remember, we're not just replacing a body, we're replacing a role. So we need the skill set and the capacity. But this is more about succession than mergers. Let's talk about what is the multiple. You know, one of the things that I try and teach everybody is multiple is the effect. As good business people, we need to focus on the cause. The, a lot of people make the mistake of trying to negotiate a multiple right away. But if you don't understand what's in the rest of the package, you really can't start with multiple. It's really the opposite. You almost end with the multiple. So there are five main variables we look at when we put together how to value an accounting firm. Now, if you bought the, one of the books I wrote recently for the AICPA and it said that there were nine variables, forgive me, I got paid by the page. I really think there's five that matter. So let's talk about them in no particular order except for the fifth one. The first one we're going to talk about is cash up front, if any. Now, in 2016, 
cash isn't as, val as available as it was in 2008. All right, so n let me tell you that historically, the amount of money put down on accounting firms is very little. There are exceptions to the deals, but we probably touched 60, 70 deals last year and this year that we either consulted or, or brought together. And I'll tell you that the down payments range from zero to 20%. Those that had a down payment, most of them were around 10%, and they were more at zero than at 20. So the amount of money up front isn't that strong of a factor in most deals that we do. And I know about people, oh, I want to have a vested interest in us. Believe me, if I'm taking over your firm and I got to carry the, the capital, you know, pay all the rent and everything for three, four months, I've got a big investment in this practice that I got to get a return on it. And if that's the only thing that's going to make me a good buyer is having that accountability, you chose the wrong buyer. But cash up front can be impacted by a lot of things people don't think about. For example, time of year. I had a firm in, in, in Atlanta that came to us in June that had billed out 80% of their revenue for the year and was looking for a strong down payment in June. Whoever bought that practice, let's say it closed in August or September, was going to be operating at a cash flow loss. They had already taken out all the profit in the firm for the entire year. Don't ask for a big down payment then. Now, if they would have asked for a balloon payment in January or May, they would have been a, a more reasonable approach. But don't ask me to take over your practice, operate at a negative cash flow, and give you a big down payment. Those things just don't add up. They don't make sense. So what is the anticipated cash flow after I acquire? Another thing that people don't think about all the time is treatment of accounts receivable. Right? We had a firm in Boston three years ago that their accounts receivable kind of reminded me of um, Charlie Manson. It was a horrible nightmare. I mean, they were way behind on all their clients. They just weren't aggressive about it. They, they were very laissez-faire. They, and they said to the buyer, hey, by the way, uh, we're averaging three to six months behind the collections. And when that money comes in, it goes to me and I want 10% down. I said to them, what are you thinking? If I'm going to have to operate all the practice for three to six months before I start participating in cash flow, that is your down payment. Matter of fact, by the way, in most mergers, the mergee has to contribute their AE on WIP to create their capital account in a successor firm. They don't even get to keep it so that there's funds to operate the combined practice. In a sale, when you collect the receivables, who gets the, the question isn't nobody's going to buy your receivables, and nobody's saying that your receivables belong to me, the successor firm. But usually, if you have significant receivables, I might need a payout period on them, let alone also giving you cash up front. So money up front could depend not just on the depth of my pocketbook, but the time of year it is, the cash flow uh, anticipation over the next six months following the closing and the treatment of accounts receivable. The second variable that people have in valuing an accounting firm is the retention period or the guarantee period. One of the impacts of the 2016 economy is there was less confidence that some clients were going to be solid for the next five, ten years. That made people even more insecure and made them demand even longer retention periods. When I talk about a retention period, what I'm referring to here is how many years after we close the deal does the loss of clients and revenues impact what the buyer owns, owes the seller. So let's Look at them in the different categories that fit into this retention period. The 80% of the small firms that I'm involved in, which let, I define small as, let's say, a half million to two million, 80% of those deals that are, that are sold to external buyers are collection deals or deal by percentage. So if you were getting the proverbial one time over five years, you were getting paid 20% of collections for five years. Right? Typically, will include fee increases, special projects, everything. I think it's very unfair for a buyer to say, hey, this client went out of business, I'm not going to pay you anymore. Oh, by the way, this client increased and we're, pay and we're charging them fee more, you're not going to get that either. Good deal's a fair deal. If the seller's going to participate in the downside, they should participate in the upside. And most of our deals are these collection deals or earn-out deals where the entire payout period is a retention period. Very rarely in an external sale, are we involved in a fixed deal where the purchase price locks day one? I can tell you in 26 years, in over 800 closings, I've been involved in two. 
that had no retention period, and they were very, very reduced valuations as a result. Internal deals where partners are buying our partners, I've seen many fixed, most are fixed, and very large deals. When I merge a $25 million firm into a top 100 firm, and there's some retiring, they often get paid fixed valuations. But that's where clients are perceived to be more brand loyal than partner loyal, and there's other variables that impact that. Very often in the country, you'll see what's called a limited retention period. One, two, three years where, let's say it's a two-year retention period, at the end of the second year, the purchase price gets fixed. So it's adjusted during years one and two based on client retention and, and, and fees, but at the end of the second year, the purchase price locks. That's a two-year retention period. Even that, by the way, is complicated because is that an average of the two years? Is that based on year two? How do we address a client that went out of business in year one and wasn't even there in year two? So there's a lot of complications to that, but, but they exist. What's very interesting, and, and by the way, I have something in here called an economy clause. For example, the last time I had a two-year retention period, the buyer said, look, if I lose a client in year three to another local accountant, shame on me. But if I lose a client in year three because they died, relocated, sold, went out of business, you lost them too. So I'd like some level of an adjustment in year three, a limited retention period, an economy clause is what I refer to it as, which is usually one year after a retention period ends, if you have one at all. I think what's really counterintuitive is which of these deals work best for the buyer and which of these work best for the seller. Uh, we reviewed almost 100 different closings over the years to see, try and get an answer for this question. Interestingly enough, the worst deal for the buyer was the deal the buyer thought protected them the most, and that was the one-year guarantee deal. What, I will tell you it's a very rare time I'm involved with the one-year retention period, but nationally they're done. And here's why the ones we have reviewed did not work out well in the most part. See, as a buyer, uh, first of all, as a CPA, you all didn't realize that when you sat for your CPA exam, there was this chemical in the cushion that came up, you, you know what, and made you all real conservative. I don't know about you, but most of my CPA firms always are telling me what's going to go wrong, not what's going to go right with things. So when the seller says to a buyer, hey, whatever you do in the first year locks the purchase price, inappropriately, but no doubt, most of them envision Moses parting the Red Sea and taking all the clients away in day 367. So there's this immediate fear and risk that clients will be lost right after the first year. Another thing that mitigates this whole the valuation in, in a one-year retention period to a lot of buyers is the fact that the buyer sits there and says, I'm not going to lose a client in month 15 that I could have lost in month three. So usually they're pretty aggressive in the transition, making things clear about the changes because they're going to shake those trees real hard day one. They don't want loose leaves falling off after the retention period. So what you usually found was a seller got paid a lower average multiple because of the risk factor from a buyer who was less, the least patient in the transition and didn't have as good of a retention percentage rate as most other deals. So actually, it turned out to be the worst deal for the seller. What worked out to be the best deal for the buyer, and this is based on a couple dozen of each of these case studies, uh, each of these stru deal structures, but the best deal for the buyer was a two-year retention period. And again, these are smaller transactions under $2 million, which is what most of you are today. I'll address the others shortly. Um, the reason that was the best deal for the buyer is statistically, if you bought my practice today and handled the clients in 2017, if they come back in 2018, they're yours. They've gone through the change, they're comfortable, and they returned. The likelihood of losing a client in years three, four, and five that came back in year two is less than fee increases, special projects. So what the buyer did was they, they lost who they were probably going to lose and locked the practice value before the fees continued to rise as they traditionally do in subsequent years. And remember, in a two-stage deal, the retention period doesn't start till, year, till stage two. But the, the two-year deal worked out to be great for the buyer with one exception. Let's call it the 10,000-pound gorilla client. In Kansas, we had a practice that was about 900,000. One client took up 200 grand. They did do a two-year retention period on all but that $200,000 client. That client, they kept on a collection basis for the entire six-year payout period because they couldn't afford to guarantee that client forever. 
It was just too big. It was the 10,000 pound gorilla claim. But again, counterintuitively, the best deal for the seller turned out to be the one that took the greatest risk, the collection deal. The reasons for that was the average multiple was much higher. When the seller was taking more of the risk away from the buyer, the buyer had to pay a higher valuation to get it. Usually, again, if we've kept the clients for a couple of years, we're going to get fee increases, special projects. The seller participates in that. So if you got 0.2 more on the multiple, for example, how many clients would you have to lose to get back to where you would have been? So it's kind of interesting but and very counterintuitive. But that's the second variable, the retention period. The third variable, I think in many ways, is the least understood, even though it sounds like it's the simplest, and that's profitability. You see, most business valuation people value a business. They value it basically 100% on the profit. What does it throw off? I, pre I never really pay much attention in a sale as opposed to a merge where I pay a lot of attention on what the seller is netting. And let me tell you as a simple example of why. Let's say three years ago I had an accounting firm, a little firm, 300, 400,000, operating out of my home. My wife answered the phone. What was my net? 85, 90%? Then we were tired of people knocking on the door. I took an office, Capcom. I hired an office manager. I decided I wanted to play golf on Wednesdays with the dentist. I hired a per diem, and now I'm netting 40%. At which point in time was my practice worth more to you as a buyer? It's irrelevant. You see, what's relevant to the buyer is their net. If they're able to absorb my practice with no incremental increases in overhead, it's very profitable. If you gotta keep my lease, you gotta keep my office manager who's been with me for 20 years and has 16 weeks paid vacation, but you gotta keep her. And you gotta do this and you gotta do that. That does what? It mitigates the successor firm's profit. Right? So profitability of the deal for the successor firm is the profitability I focus on, not the seller's current net. I also wrote an article once for the AICPA called The Great Mystery of Billing Rates. Billing rates you can't look at on a piece of paper and say that's the billing rate. I'll give you a great example. Two years ago in Florida, in southeast Florida, we had an unusual firm. It was a million two. It had two owners who were both get out at the same time, which is also unusual, but at any rate, they, were, they did 100% of the heavy lifting. They had six clerical people that handled all the bookkeeping and write-up. They did all the big work. One of my clients, who was a larger firm, went in there and was interested in acquiring it. When got to due diligence, they called me up and said, Joel, we have a problem. We should have known it before because it was on the information sheet, but they're only getting $200 an hour for partner time. We get $300. We can't do this. I said, well, you just did due diligence. Not who's going to hold the client's hands, but in their firm, rather in your firm as the buyer, you have partners, you have managers, you have seniors, you have juniors. They just have their two owners and some bookkeepers. So not who's going to hold the client's hands, but who's in your successor firm is going to do the work that these two partners did. They said, oh, almost all the work these partners are doing are senior work for us. I said, what's your seniors get in a billing rate? They said, one and a quarter to, two, to 150. I said, I guess they're getting 200 an hour now. See, we can't look at what the, six, the seller was doing, what time and effort, and what level staff will the buyer be using. And it's not always Nirvana. I mean, most of the time it's a good thing because most likely the successor firm has more tiers to, to leverage the work to, maybe better technology to get it done quicker. But I've had the opposite happen too. I lost a deal in New Jersey three years ago where it was a three, two and a half million dollar firm, three equity owners. Turned out that they had one, they, 20 percent of their firm were audits. When we got to due diligence, we found out that their audit partner handled the audits 100 percent by himself from beginning to end. The successor firm said to him, John, you know, we have to have two pair of eyes review all of that test work for our internal quality control process. It would have taken them twice as much time on the audits to divide the same fee. The deal fell apart. So we can't look at a piece of paper and say, this is the, the seller's profit, this is the seller's billing rate, that tells us everything. We have to transpose what that rate, what that profit's going to be in the successor firm. 
Another thing that people fail to do a lot of times is make sure before, when they're putting their valuation together, they've discussed the tax ramifications of the deal. Listen, I get it. If I'm a seller, I want goodwill. But my problem as a seller of an accounting firm is I'm selling to an accountant. If I'm expecting a five, six year payout and they're going to deduct it over 15, they're going to pay me a lot less. That's why so many deals will have a big allocation to consulting. Yes, as I'm going to have to pay a higher level of tax if I'm the seller taking consulting, but I'm also going to get to feed retirement plans, pay car leases, pay medical insurance, do all sorts of things. So a lot of my pre-tax dollars will get applied. And if I'm offered a difference of, you know, instead of 0.85 one time, but one time as a consultant versus 0.85 as goodwill, which one's better for me? I will tell you that we have to be more open-minded about tax structure, but we have to make that part of our what? Profitability plan. So the third variable is profitability. The fourth variable is the duration of the payout period. Now, I will tell you that larger firms tend to not only get lower multiples, but much longer payout periods. For my firms doing three, four million and up, almost all their payout periods are going to be 10 years. For my $500,000 seller, most of them are going to be five years. I'd say four to seven for small firms is typical with the highest probability of it being five or six years. Eight to 10 for larger firms with the highest probability of being 10 years. But that's a simple variable, but an important one. So the first variable is cash up front, if any. The second variable is the duration of the retention period, if any. The third variable is the profitability of the deal, including tax consequences, billing rates, everything. The fourth variable is the duration of the payout period. The fifth variable is the multiple, because the multiple is the effect. The other things are the cause. Let's take an example. Think of the following equation, the less money down, the longer the payout period, the longer the retention period, the more profitably the deal is structured, the higher the valuation. And the opposite. Ask me to pay you with more money up front, shorter retention period, shorter, shorter payout period, you know, goodwill, I'm going to pay you less. Let's take an example. Let's say all of you on the phone today with me, who I'm sorry that you're stuck with this nasally New Yorker, but let's say all of you on the phone with me today are interested in buying this $400,000 practice. And let's also say as our second premise to that, all of you could absorb it with no incremental increases in overhead. If I said, would you buy that practice for 15% of collections for 10 years with no cash down, would you do it? I haven't had a deal at one and a half times in a year or two. Okay? But that's one and a half times. Would you do it? I would do it in a heartbeat. Let me tell you why. First of all, if I wanted to be aggressive and raise the fees 7.5% in years one and two, I'd pay for the whole acquisition. If after five years I lost a client, I collected 500% and I paid 0.75. This is a very profitable deal for me. I would do that in a heartbeat. Right? Now, some of you might say, well, part of the, what I'm not thinking about is present value because it's a 10-year payout. You're right, I'm not entering it into the equation. I'm not entering it for two reasons. One, I hate present value. I mean, I get it, but I always kind of followed around with it, never mastered it. But the big reason is present value is really predicated on interest. If I'm paying you 15% of collections for five years and the practice goes from 400000 to 500 to 600 those, and I'm paying you on those increases, it's better than any interest factor. The reason I would do that deal in a heartbeat is because of cash flows, because of the safety involved in it. But now the same seller says, Joel, I want to get paid off in five years. And whatever you do in the second year locks the purchase price. I'll still give you a current deduction, though, and I want 10% up front. Well, depending where you are in the country, you're probably looking at 0.75 to one and a quarter. Same seller says, Joel, I want to be paid out in three years, and whatever you do in the first year locks the purchase price. I want goodwill and 20% down. Most likely, the valuation is going to be between 0.5 and 0.75, 0.8. Same seller says, I want all cash at closing. I doubt I can get them 0.5. So here we are with the same exact practice that I'd struggle to get them 0.5, yet I could get them 1.5 in a heartbeat. So the point here is the multiple is the effect. We need to structure our deals from a complete holistic approach. 
And one of the problems that I see all the time are people not looking at all these variables when negotiating their deal. I got a call last week from a firm in Chicago. They said, Joel, we've worked everything out, the buyer, the seller, and I. We just need someone to draft the agreement to help us plan the transition and the integration. We'd like to hire you. I said, well, send me the term sheet. Let me see what the deal is. I get back that it's a five-year payout with a, with a one-time multiple. I call back the seller and the buyer. I say, hey, I got a question for you. What's the t tax ramifications of the payout? Seller says goodwill is the same time the buyer says current deduction. I said, what's the retention period? The seller said, what do you mean retention period? The buyer said, well, aren't I paying based on collections? And the seller said, what do you mean collections? They didn't work out half the stuff. You can't negotiate in pieces. When you make an offer, you have to have everything. How much of money up front, if any? If it's a collection deal and I'm giving you 10% up front and then paying you whatever, how am I crediting that back? Is it coming back off the first year, the second year? Or am I reducing the percentage of, that I pay you based on the money I gave you up front? What's the tax consequences? What's the payout period? All these things have to be put together or you're going to go back and forth and negotiate. By putting it all together at once, you've created the scales of justice. So if the seller says, I want to get paid in five years, not six, well, if you take that off scale on right, what are we going to do on scale on left? It creates a more positive environment to work out a win-win deal. One of the other things I get asked a lot is, I think, or stated to me a lot, is, Joel, isn't a business client worth more than a tax client? I hear that very frequently. And, I'll, and then I asked the group, as I did not too long ago when this came up at a, at, a, at a place I was speaking, I said to the group, I said, on a pure hourly basis, what do you make more on, 1040 or on the business account? And almost everybody said the 1040. I said, on a liability perspective, where do you have more liability, on the 1040 or handling the business client? Oh, the business client. On an accounts receivable, what do you do better in collecting? Your business accounts or your 10, oh, my 1040 account. So I said, okay, so why do you want to pay less for the 1040 client? I got two answers. The first one was, well, it comes at a terrible time of year. My response to that was, you chose to be a CPA, get over it, never bring that up again. That's the playing field. Nothing you could do about it. Second point was a valid point, one that happens to be true that the retention rate on 1040 clients is less than business clients. Ah, but that means it's a retention issue. See, if I'm paying you, let's just use the proverbial 20% of collections for five years or 15% for seven, I can't reduce the value for a 1040 or an annual client versus a business client because if I lose the client, I stop paying for it anyway. There's no justification. But if it was a one or two year guarantee period, and you, it will impact the multiple because one visit doesn't constitute loyalty. So if you tell me you want me to buy your 1040 business and, and only have a one-year guarantee, it's going to definitely have a negative impact in your value. So tax versus business clients has an impact, but it's a little different than what most people think. So again, when valuing an accounting firm, let's look at all of these options. And now before we go into a couple of minor points and talk about about how partners buy our partners and keys to transition. Let's get our fourth polling question in. Okay, the fourth polling question is on the screen. This one is, which best describes your personal situation over the next five years? So are you planning to reduce your role and your time in the practice? Do you have partners who are going to be reducing their role? Do you plan to acquire another firm or none of the above? And again, as Joel said, this is the fourth. That means we have two more after this, and all six are required in order to get the full two CPE. We'll give everyone just about five more seconds. So if you haven't voted, do so now. And I'll go ahead and close the poll. 70% say that they are planning to reduce their role and their time in the practice. And then 18% none of the above, and a pretty split between the other two options. Well, hopefully we're bringing value to that large group. Um, what we're going to look at now are a couple of other smaller aspects of valuing. Valuing when buying out partners, and a very important thing for the end, keys to client retention. Because the greatest measure of success of any deal is client retention. But as far as acquiring a firm, there's other things to think about. For most small deals, someone will say to me, what's my furniture, fixtures, and equipment worth? My answer is zero. Never ask me again. 
when you're acquiring or merging in a $30 million firm, there's always a valuation for the hard assets. When you're acquiring a small practice, most likely they don't want your furniture, fixtures, equipment, your computers, or anything. Right? So it's very, very rare that there's an additional value placed for the hard assets. You know, if I'm taking over a lease, things like that, they, it's going to impact value because it impacts profit. If you have some great staff joining the firm, that might actually increase the, that my valuation on your firm because of my coveting of good young staff. Right? One of the big questions you also have to think about as, in, as it relates to retention period is what happens if fees go up? So I bought a practice, I had a client, I was getting 10 grand and I'm able to now get 15. As I mentioned before, most of the time the seller should participate in that. Don't ask the seller to participate on one side without the other. There are some times though where fee increases for new services are looked at a little differently. Not too long ago in Providence, I consulted, in a, it wasn't Providence, but that area, I consulted on a firm that was selling to a larger firm. Now the firm that was selling outsourced all the audits in their firm. The successor firm did audits. But they sat there and they said to the seller, look, audits are less profitable for us because there's a lot more labor intensive, blah, blah, blah. I don't mind giving you something for, uh, for, the, for these things, but we're not going to value it the same. And the buyer and seller felt that they agreed to it. So sometimes if there's a fee increase from a service the, the seller never did that the buyer did, the seller's always going to participate in it, most of the time at the same level, sometimes at a lower level. What I almost never see, I mean less than 1% of the deals I've been involved in, did the seller ever get anything if a client refers a client? I know that the seller's argument is, well, you wouldn't have had, if I didn't sell you that client, A, you wouldn't have gotten that referral. But that's part of what we're paying the value for. That's part of the valuation of your firm is we know we're buying a referral base. If I did a great job and got a referral, that's the fruit of my labor. But I will almost always give every seller or mergee a new business incentive program. And I like to make them more powerful than others. I've had firms say, oh, yeah, I'll give you 5% for a year or two. Very motivating, isn't that? I'd rather give the seller 10, 15, 20%, one, two, three years. If I'm going to ask you to be an all-commissioned salesperson for me, I want to make it worth your while to do. We can't lose. If you bring me a client that I would have charged 10 grand, I charge 12. If I get them, great. If I don't, I never had them. And you make money, I make money. Everybody's going to win on that. But I'm a big, big fan of that. When we're selling a firm to a partner, there are some things to keep in mind. Okay. For example, they almost always go for less. You know, you'd never, it's very rare that if I'm selling my, my share of equity in my firm to a partner, I'm going to get the same value as I would in the street. And there's reasons for that. I mean, the big reason is sweat equity. Maybe when Gretchen, Nikki, and I all got together, we were doing a half a million dollars. We're doing three million now. Aren't, I, aren't the two of them part of the reason we grew? So number one, they almost always go for less. A disconcerting thing to me, that's, uh, that can be managed when managed correctly, is it's very rare time that when a partner retires, their buyout is anything but fixed. We'll talk about fixed based on what, comp, equity, what kind of multiples. We'll talk about that in a, f in a few minutes. But a lot of times partners in their partnership agreement, and by the way, if you have a partnership agreement and it's not signed, you don't have a partnership agreement, okay, just an FYI. But that's a separate issue. Um, Many times I'll see in a partner buyout that there's no retention period. Now, a lot of these smaller firms, I'm, I'm working with a three-partner firm in Chicago that each have their own book of business and no partner speaks to anybody else's clients. If client A got hit by the bus, why would we think that, that, that partners B and C would be able to retain them all? Yet there's a fixed guaranteed purchase price. Now, there are things that you could do to make that overcomable. For example, in most large firms, what we do is we require two or three years notice. And by giving us two or three years notice and entering into a, a bona fide appropriate transition plan, if you do a great job in two or three years transitioning the relationships, well, it's incumbent on me, the successor firm, and your, your former partners to retain the clients and pay you for it. But if you fail to give me two or three years notice, there's usually a penalty. Some firms will reduce the value. I used to play basketball in Brooklyn. If you weren't bleeding, you, it wasn't a foul. So I say no, no, no blood, no foul. So to me, 
if you don't give me my two or three years of notice, I get a two or three year retention period. If the fees go down during those two or three years after you leave, you get a radical reduction in your comp. If they don't go down, nothing, no loss to either of us. But it's very important, especially in smaller firms that have fixed buyouts, that you require notification that you protect yourself in death and disability, hopefully by insurance. If not, remember, if I got hit by the bus and I didn't have insurance, I didn't give you two years notice. There's got to be a two-year retention period. What a lot of people forget is an ownership agreement is not designed to protect the partners. It's designed to protect the firm. If the firm doesn't uh, survive, nobody's getting their buyouts. So it's very important when we have an internal sale is structured correctly. Here's another basic premise, and we're going to get into a lot more nitty-gritty about it in a minute. But if I'm, if I'm selling my equity ownership to my partners, my partners should make more money. Right? We've helped, there's, there's quite a few people on, on this session with me right now. Between us, we've probably helped over, well over 1,000 people make a decision about buying a business. Have we ever said to our clients, I just performed due diligence based on the value you were placing and my due diligence, you're going to lose money for five or six years, maybe break even, it's a great deal, you've got to do it. Of course not. Well, we can't tell that to our clients, to our partners rather. Right? We can't tell our partners, buy me out and make less money. That's not an incentive to attract young people or to have a buyout. So I'm going to give you a simple litmus test that we'll see how it works in a minute. But let's say I'm making $350,000 a year, including perks and benefits as a partner. F from that, and I'm retiring. From that, we've got to subtract the cost of replacing my labor and the purchase price. If what's left is a positive number, then you're getting paid for your years of sweat equity and I'm making more money. If what's left is not, why would I do the deal? We're also finding that a trend, especially in our larger firms, of paying someone based on their equity ownership in the firm is dissipating. It's becoming more and more common to have a buyout based on comp. Also, how do accounts receivable and working process impact? For example, many firms will, when you retire, you'll get paid for your ownership and get paid for your capital. Some inflate the value of the ownership and you don't get for capital, but we have to think about that. And just as we were thinking about valuing an accounting firm on an external sale, looking at the tax treatment, we have to look at the tax treatment for retiring partner. If they want goodwill, if their payout period is 15 years, okay. If it's eight years, it's not okay. So what's the tax treatment? Are we going to use, for example, IRC code 736A1, which enables a partner to get money as ordinary income and the buyer to get a current deduction? There are some tricks to the trade, one of which is they have to get a payment for life. So even when the payout period ends, you've got to give them 100 bucks for the rest of their lives. But all these things are some of the things you need to think about. But remember, an internal sale is less of a business deal than an external sale. We're selling our practice to our partners. Now, when valuing one's equity, there are four main ways that you see that being done. Some firms will base the value of a partner's buyout on the book of business they manage. Uh, so if I'm managing a $600,000 book in our firm, uh, my buyout's based on those clients. Some will base it on equity. I have a $7 million firm in Florida that has a 40, 40, and 20% equity owner. The 20%, they, their buyout is on a fixed multiple times their equity interest in the entire firm. Most of the top 100 and G400 firms that I work with have changed their buyout to be based on compensation where they get a multiple, as I'll explain better shortly, a multiple of compensation. And many firms use a hybrid approach, some of it based on one of those three values, some of it based on another. Not usually all three, but sometimes you'll see something based on comp and something in additional based on equity. So you'll see these hybrid approaches. Based on the 2012 PCPS succession survey, and the 2016 will be coming out very shortly, and if you're a member of the PCPS division of the AICPA, you'll get that for free. If you're not a member, you should be. They have some great resources for firms, especially firms that are looking at succession and growth through M&A. But there's a va the valuation method is as follows of the firms that were surveyed, which were quite a large number. 37% of the firms buy out partners based on a multiple times of something, which we'll talk about, it could be 0.5, could be one time, of their equity times the revenue of the firm. 
16% used it on the book of business that they managed, 22% on compensation, and 25% on something else, which again was usually a hybrid of these things. In making sure that the deal passes the valuation, the litmus test I shared, that's where you do a backwards valuation. You reward your retiring partners fairly for their years of sweat equity, but your remaining partners should never have to borrow money. They should never have to take a step back in compensation to do it. Let me tell you, we get calls all the time. I'm a partner at a firm, and I'm looking at our partnership agreement. When Murray and David and John retire, I'm going to make less money. I have the right to leave with my book of business. Do you think anybody would want me? I'm 42 years old, and I have a million-dollar book of business. Oh, my God, everybody wants you. So these people have choices. Don't put yourself in a position that you're not attractive to another firm. You're not attractive to that young partner to, be, to buy into your firm. If the buyout means I'm going to let, lose money, why would I do that deal? So we have to have the right financial arrangement. So we have the available capital as the partner's foregone compensation. In the example I used before, let's say it's 350. From that, we have to replace the labor and we have to have a buyout. And there has to be meat left on the bone because the remaining partners not only are assuming the obligation, but most likely assuming extra work. I'm not going to work harder, assume a debt and make less. So we have to find that compromise. A lot of times it's not that challenging. Maybe we just need a longer payout period so we can still get to a strong number, but make sure cash flows positive for the, six, for the re remaining partners in the firm. Everybody can win in this case. It's not that challenging. Right? So the other thing you have to remember is some people will have, for example, a mandatory retirement at age 65, but they'll say, well, stay on. Well, if you're going to stay on and expect to make the same money you were making before, it's unlikely I could pay you for your equity at the same time. And if you do, if, if I'm going to start your buyout and you're going to stay on, you'll probably have to stay on for less, less money. An example, like I gave before, a third of what you build out for. Remember, part of the reason we get, as an owner, we get paid more money because we're getting paid for the job we do and getting paid for ownership. If I'm no longer an owner, I've got to be paid as a non-owner because it's a cash flow burden. This kind of brings us back to a version of the two-stage deal in an internal buyout. And while we're on the subject, let's talk a minute about mandatory retirement. You know, I've never seen a, a subject that I've had more conflict with personally in, in our M&A and partnership agreements because we've reviewed more partnership agreements than any way you could imagine. And I get it. See, here's the quandary. We're about to lose the greatest volume of our best talent ever at a time we could barely replace them. Yet we're saying to them, based on your birth certificate, you have to retire at this point in time. A lot of times they just have to surrender their equity and they can stay on, but at a reduced role. But let me tell you why, as much as I hate that, especially if someone who's 58 and, and looking at 65 in, in, in the mirror, I get it. Because if I'm a 40-year-old and I'm looking at one fir two firms to join and one firm has mandatory retirement, the other doesn't. If everything else is equal, I'm going to the firm with mandatory retirement because now I don't have to wait for someone to die to become a, par a full partner. So it's important. I don't like it, but, I, but it is a definite tool for attraction. Right Now, for people that are using a multiple of equity, less than 10%. So in other words, I own 30% of the practice. Firm's doing 3 million. That's what my buyout should be based on. Well, less than 10% used more than one time. For about 40% used one time. And about 30% used between 0.75 and 1. A lot of, and you'll see some of these things in a moment. Valuation method of, of people using comp. Let me tell you how most of the time that works. Most of the time what that means is a firm will say to you, let's look at your last five years' income on an accrual basis, average that, and multiply it by some number. In today's world, usually between two and three times. So, for example, based on when this survey was done in 2012, about almost 40% used three times comp. Typically, by the way, paid out over 10 years, typically plus capital paid out over from five to 10 years. 15% used two and a half times and between 15 and 20 percent used two times and here's some of those examples based on size all right these are do you even have a plan 
And if you have a plan, is the purchase price based on a multiple of salary, a, a, a multiple of ownership? Is it based on book of business? And here's your percentages. As you'll see, as revenues go up, you'll start to see more and more people get paid on a multiple of compensation, and equity becomes less of a factor. On a lot of them that list other, it's where it ties in heavily on the multiple of salary and something about ownership is usually there. Now also keep this in mind, these are all the 2012 surveys. What you're going to see in the 2016, which I've been privy to some information, is a, is a reduction in the valuations. Values have come down. Look, in 1990 to 95, I had deals for small firms one and a half to two times. In uh, 1999, 2000, you know, one, one and a half times. Now I'm, most of the deals I'm involved in are on an external sale of 0.75 to one and a quarter. So values are coming down and we see that more and more in these statistics. Here's an example of people that are getting paid based on an equity times a multiple. And once again, as you go up in revenue, you start to see valuations dropping more and more. Now the positive is most of the time it's fixed. The negative is it's clearly less than what an external sale would be. Multiples of comp, in this report, you actually saw a whole bunch of, uh, you know, at the very high end, at three and a half times. I will tell you that most firms are between two and three times now, and I'd say m more and more of them are around the two and a half times comp. And again, most of the time, paid out in 10 years, all of these buyouts for, for firms, most of them, are, especially larger firms, are usually 10 years usually on a K-1 or something else that gives the firm a current deduction. Usually capital is paid out over five to 10 years. But sometimes you'll see a firm say, I'm gonna pay you three times comp without capital, or two, and, and the, or two, which many times works out to be very similar to the two and a half times plus capital. So these things can vary greatly, all right? Other things that you're gonna to have to think about whenever you're valuing these firms, are accounts receivable, how we're gonna treat them, that's the, is that part of their capital account? You know, when some of the due diligence we're going to be doing is going to relate to time and billing versus retainers in a merger. Some cultures are very hard to mix and match. For example, it's hard to take and eat what you kill firm and bring it into a firm that's a one firm client mentality. Usually larger firms, lower multiples. And there's a lot of reasons for that. First of all, an average firm doing 10 to million to, to, to 500 million is making what? A third, right? One third labor, one third overhead, one third profit. Yeah, yeah. a lot of sole practitioners with $500,000 practices making over 50%. But also, let's remember, you could acquire a firm doing 500,000 and absorb them. You can't absorb a $25 million firm without significant incremental increases in overhead. And I'd rather get point. 0.75 times 10 million, then one time times 500,000 anyway. But also what's kind of interesting is in larger firm deals, when they merge up, those who are getting bought out will get a valuation for furniture, fixtures, and equipment. But when you're doing $30 million, you have a huge investment in, in IT and things like that. But remember about this culture stuff. Some of them are really hard to do. Let's get one more polling question in because we only have 10 minutes that I will, and I want to spend some time on transitioning client relationships. Okay, your most likely succession plan looks like, here are your options are finding an external buyer, selling internally to my partners or staff, or no idea. And I'll leave that open a few more seconds. Now, um, I understand our, our webinar was scheduled till 2.40, but it sounds like, Joel, you've still got some more content. Is that right? Yeah, I'll go through it quickly. I forgot okay, I it was 250. My fault. My fault. That's okay. I was just going to say, if anybody does need to sign off at 2.40, I can send you the link to the survey. Otherwise, please stay on until the end, and then you can do the survey just in the web browser. Um, but I'll go ahead and close the poll and send it back to you, Joel, to, to finish up here. Thank you. Okay, a couple of things to close up. First thing, my four C's. Remember, if you don't want to eat lunch with someone, don't do a deal with them. Right? If you're not comfortable with them, why are the clients going to be? Remember, if someone's going to have to make wholesale changes to the way you operate the practice and you're not going to have continuity, your clients like the way your ship is sailing, don't go to someone who's going to change it all. Be very mindful of the culture. Culture could be a lot of things. You know, some firms are, are, are suit and tie. Some are warm-up jackets. 
Some are billing, uh, you know, value billing. Others are retainer based. Others are time and billing. You know, some IP cultures are hard to match. N while we're looking at chemistry, continuity, and culture, not enough people think about capacity. Do they have the skill set and capacity to replace you? We got to make sure we find that good balance between a good deal being a fair deal to both people, the buyer or successor firm making more money and the seller being paid for years of sweat equity. And remember to look at the whole package, not one variable versus another. You can increase your firm's value by getting your metrics up, by embracing technology, avoiding tough leases that you're going to leave people with, and having good talent, and sharing client relationships. Your firm's more attractive if clients are used to dealing with several people than if they only deal with one person because one's more challenging to transition than the other. But the greatest measure of success of any deal is client retention. So you have to decide who gets a phone call, who gets a visit, who gets a letter. You know, you don't send an announcement letter to a $50,000 a year client, nor should you go alone. I had a firm that went alone to meet a client and the, told the client how I merged with this great firm. They, they do everything in, in the retail business just like you do, blah, blah, blah. The client said, that's great, Murray, but you're the guy I deal with. If he would have brought the new partner with him, that client would have said, nice to meet you, Jane. Never want to see you again here. So you've got to make a plan. You know, who gets that letter, visit, phone call? The name is usually one of the most overrated things on the planet. Very rarely does your name really have a brand. But one of the things you can do is if Nikki's buying my firm, we could say Joel Sink and CPA PC division of Nikki Johnston for a little while and then just fall to Nikki's. But when doing a transition, you want to focus on two types of changes. Change behind the door, change in front of the door. Change behind the door is you were using Lacert, I'm using CCH, your clients won't care. Your staff might, but your clients aren't going to care. That's not going to impact retention. Changes in front of the door will. So you have to say to yourself, how am I going to retain these clients? Well, let's understand their fears. Most clients have four fears. Is the partner or owner still there that, I, that I've trusted all these years? Is it going to cost me more money? Do I now have to travel an obscene distance to meet with the firm? And many clients are accustomed to dealing with staff. Are they going to be there? So part of your job is to send that right message. So if I'm sending an announcement letter, I might break down the clients into industries. So let's say the first industry is doctors. My announcement letter might say something like this, if I'm the seller and Nikki's the buyer. I'm pleased to announce I've merged with Nikki. She has great expertise in the Obama tax laws and the modern computerization of accounting, especially as it relates to the medical community. Together, we'll be able to provide you additional services, yet maintain the same fee structure. I will remain the principal in charge of you as a client. The same staff you're used to dealing with are part of our new combined dedicated team of professionals. And we remain geographically sensitively located here in New York. In the first paragraph, I said, I'm still here. The fee is the same. The staff you're used to dealing with is here, and we're in the same area. The greater the loyalty between you and your clients, the easier it should be to retain them. Change is a dirty word. What you're not going to emphasize is the loss of anything, but the gain. Why this is better for them. It, that's why very rarely is a sale held out as a sale. It's held out as a merger. Forgive me that I have the, my watch 10 minutes slow and I race through this last. Then anybody has any questions, please don't hesitate to call us. We do have some closing business. It's very important to get you the CPE you well deserve to do one more polling question, and then we'll get you out of here only a couple minutes late. Nikki? Okay, the last polling question is on the screen. How many blow down over the next five years? Here it's none, all, most, or some. So a pretty quick one to answer. Um, as I said before, please take a moment to complete that survey once we end the webinar before you close your browser. If for some reason you're unable to because of our being a few minutes late, just send me an email and I would be happy to give you a link and you can do that survey later. Either way, once you've done some sort of online survey and of course the polling questions you already completed, you'll qualify for the CPE and then I will email your certificate. So if you have any questions about content, you can contact Joel at the information on your screen. If you have any questions about your CPE certificate, you can reach me by responding to one of those emails. Um, that said, I think we're ready to close up. So thank you so much, Joel. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and I hope you all enjoyed the webinar. Have a great day, all.